Sophie, who is going to talk to us about Turkey and the EU. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you for your attention. So the title of my presentation is Turkey's EU Membership, Opportunities and Challenges. Turkey's possible accession presents the EU with many challenges and opportunities and raises significant questions about the nature and identity of the European Union and about its role in the international community. Okay, so here's a brief outline of what I'll be discussing. I'll provide you with a brief history of Turkey's steps towards EU accession, then about the membership conditions, discourses for and against Turkish EU membership, then official views from the UK, from France, Germany, and from Turkey, and as well as the public opinion, both from the European side and from the Turkish side. And then I'll have a look at some current challenges and future prospects of Turkey's accession into the European Union. Okay, so here are some reflective questions that you can keep in mind while I do the presentation. Is Turkey a European country? What is the nature of the European Union? Will Turkey be an asset or a liability to the European Union? What are the economic, political, social, cultural and religious implications of Turkish accession? Okay, so EU-Turkish relations date back to the early stages of the European integration process. In 1959, eight years after the establishment of the European Coal and Steel Community, Turkey applied for associate membership in the European Economic Community. In 1963, Turkey signed the agreement creating an association between Turkey and the European Economic Community, commonly referred to as the Ankara Agreement. In November 1970, the additional protocol established a timetable for the abolition of tariffs and quotas on goods traded between Turkey and the EEC. In 1987, Turkey submitted its application for formal membership in the European Community. In 1989, the European Commission argued that Turkey's economic and political situation, its poor relations with Greece, and its ongoing conflict with Cyprus created an unfavourable environment to begin negotiations. Despite these setbacks, in 1995, a customs union was established between the EU and Turkey. In 1999, the Helsinki European Council officially recognised Turkey as a candidate for membership. In December 2004, the European Council decided to start negotiations with Turkey, which culminated to Turkey's official status as a candidate for full membership in October 2005. So the membership conditions are divided into three major areas. So the first one for a candidate to enter into the EU, there are legal requirements. So according to Article 237 of the Treaty of Rome, any European state may apply to become a member of the community. Article F of the Maastricht Treaty adds that the member states shall have systems of government founded on the principles of democracy. The second criteria is the Copenhagen Criteria. In 1993, following requests from former communist countries to join the EU, the European Council established three criteria which member states should fulfill in order to become members. By the time they join, new members must have first one, stable institutions guaranteeing democracy, the rule of law, human rights and respect for protection and of minorities. Second, functioning market economy and the capacity to cope with competitive pressure and market forces within the European Union. And third, the ability to take on the obligations of, member, of membership including support for the aims of the Union. They must have a public administration capable of applying and managing EU laws in practice. And the third criteria is the accession process. The entry negotiations are carried out between each candidate country and the European Commission, which represents the EU. Once these are concluded, the decision to allow a new country to join the EU must be taken unanimously by the existing member states in the Council. And the European Parliament must give its assent through a positive vote by absolute majority of its members. 
and all accession treaties must then be ratified by the member states and candidate countries in accordance with each country's constitutional procedures. Okay, so discourses for and against Turkish EU membership. Despite Turkey's positive progression towards EU membership, European and Turkish governments, political parties and citizens remain deeply divided on whether Turkey should become a member of the European Union. So first, there is a geographic debate. So those arguing in favour of Turkey's EU accession have claimed that Turkish membership would have important strategic advantages for the European Union that would strengthen the EU's cooperation on defence and security matters, particularly in dealing with Iran's nuclear threat and with Iraq's transition to a peaceful and democratic state. It would also be an invaluable bridge between Europe and Asia by demonstrating that Western-style democracy and economic prosperity is achievable in a country with an overwhelmingly Muslim population. Those arguing against have argued that 97% of its territory lies in Asia. And that was actually an argument put forward by the former president of France, Nicolas Sarkozy. Now the political debate. Those who have argued for have stated that Turkey is a vibrant democracy and prospects of EU membership have and continue to prompt reforms that strengthen pluralistic politics and improve human rights. They argue that rejecting Turkish membership now would undermine European credibility. On the other hand, opponents maintain that Turkey is not a mature European-style democracy. Its human rights are routinely abused, which is evident in the Amnesty International's annual report, whereby there have been numerous accounts of torture, free speech violations, denial of minority rights, unfailed trials, failure to protect women, and Europe would also import the Kurdish issue. To the economic debate, supporters of Turkey's succession emphasize Turkey's economic potential as an asset to the European Union. Often argued that Turkey's populous, youthful population compared to the EU's rapidly aging population would provide an excellent market for European goods and potential source of labor. They also argue that Turkey's ec um, economy was fastest growing in Europe in 2011, growing at 8.5% which was the second fastest after China among major market economies. Opponents argue that Turkey is, I quote, too big, too poor, and too Muslim, end of quote. Critics argue that Turkey's population size of approximately 74 million in 2011 would have significant implications on the population-based European Parliament, altering the balance of power in the European Union. They also argue that Turkey would send the largest number of MEPs into the European Parliament and gaining the most dominant position in the Council. Skeptics have also asserted that Tur Turkey's low per capita income and its significant agricultural sector, which employs about 33% of the workforce, compared with about 5% of the then EU27, that's 28 with Croatia entering, would represent an enormous burden on the EU's budget, particularly if major reforms of the common agricultural policy were not enforced. <coughs> okay, now with the question of identity, proponents Good of afternoon, I ladies and gentlemen. Sorry. Welcome to the Immigration Museum. In approximately five minutes' time, there will be a highlights tour leaving the ground floor. If you'd like to join the tour, Please come to the area opposite the reception desk on the ground floor. Thank you. I do apologise. No problem. The proponents claim that Turkey's membership would demonstrate the limitations of the clash of civilization theory. It would emphasise the fact that the EU is not limited to a Christian club, as reported by certain European conservatives but that its values are open to all who want to apply. They also argue that Turkey's accession would send a positive message to the rest of the world, particularly in the Middle Eastern region, by demonstrating that democracy and Islam are compatible. Omer Tasminar, an expert on Turkey and EU relations, 
argues that Europe as a postmodern construct should not be based on cultural and religious homogeneity, but on multiculturalism, pluralism, and democracy. Europe's identity should be defined according to the values it purports, including liberty, solidarity, pluralism, tolerance, and human rights, as opposed to exclusionary ideas of culture and religion. He also argues that Turkey's accession would provide a potential for the development of a genuine Euro-Islam based on mutual respect and understanding, which could further alienate Islamic radicalization. Um, those arguing against have stated that Turkey's historic and cultural roots lie in Central Asia and the Middle East, and that Turkey lacks shared experiences from the European cultural legacy of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and World War II, which initiated the drive for a united Europe. And they also argue that Muslim, a Muslim country, Turkey's cultural traditions are fundamentally different from that of Christian Europe. So the EU and Turkish membership. So the official um, UK view, on the 4th of November 2009, David Miliband, the Foreign Secretary of the UK, during a visit to Turkey, underlined the UK government's support for Turkish EU membership, saying, quote, I am very clear that Turkish succession to the EU is important and will be of huge benefit to both Turkey and the EU, end of quote. On the 27th of July 2010, David Cameron, PM of the UK, during a visit to Turkey, promised to fight for Turkey's membership of the EU saying he is angry at the slow pace of negotiations. He stated that, quote, the EU without Turkey at its heart is not stronger but weaker, not more secure but less, not richer but poorer, end of quote. The prospect of Turkish EU membership has received opposition among French elites. Underpinning French elite skepticism has been cultural religious debates and the future balance of power within the EU that Turkey will bring. The fact that France struggles to integrate its Muslim minority, the largest in Europe, has affected the accession debate. These concerns were reinforced by the former French president Nicolas Sarkozy during an interview with Charlie Rose, an American television interviewer and journalist. Sarkozy emphasized Turkey's geographical location Quote, Turkey is not in Europe, Turkey is in Asia Minor. And its prom um, prominent um, Muslim culture, Turkey has a different civilization culture. Instead, he proposed that Turkey remains a partner of Europe. François Hollande, so the current French president of France, prepared to was prepared to open talks on the chapter related to EU support for regions within the bloc. The Socialist Party has been more supportive of Turkey's membership bid than its predecessor. Similarly, Germany's issues on immigration and, inter and integration are also key ingredients fermenting opposition to Turkish membership. Germany is home to three million Turkish immigrants, many of, of whom come from the southeast regions of Turkey. Consequently, many Turkish immigrants have remained largely traditionalist and have found it difficult to integrate into German society. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has repeatedly opposed full membership of Turkey to the EU on German-Turkish summits, advocated, advocating instead a privileged partnership. In September 2011, during a visit of the Turkish President Gul, Merkel said, we don't want the full membership of Turkey, but we don't want to lose Turkey as an important country referring to her idea of a strategic partnership instead. In February 2013, Merkel said, quote, I believe we have a long negotiation road ahead of us. Although I am skeptical, I am for the continuation of the process and for opening a new chapter, end of quote. So when analyzing the arguments presented by both the former president of France, Nicolas Sarkozy, and the German Chancellor Angela Merkel against Turkey's EU membership, it is evident that France and Germany have adopted a more value-based interpretation of the EU. Instead of encouraging Turkish EU membership, Merkel and Sarkozy proposed a privileged partnership between Turkey and the EU, which would enable the, the EU and Turkey to make the most 
of the economic advantages while limiting the impact of cultural and religious tensions. So the European public. Um, public opinion in EU countries generally opposes Turkish membership. A Eurobarometer in 2006 survey revealed that 59% of the EU27 citizens are against Turkey joining the EU, while 28% are in favour. Nearly all citizens, about 9 out of 10, express concerns about human rights as their leading cause. In the early March-May 2006 Eurobarometer, citizens from the new member states were more in favour of, of Turkey joining, so 44% in favour. So Turkey's view on EU membership. We have a picture of Istanbul and Ankara, which you can see in Turkey. So since 2002, the Turkish parliament has made a number of constitutional changes to ameliorate Turkey's democracy, including significant legislation alterations on capital punishment. Turkish elites have adopted a more rights-based conception of the European Union. This is reinforced in a speech presented to the European Commission in 2004 by Erdogan, who stated that, I quote, the idea of a Christian Europe belongs to the Middle Ages. The EU must recognize that it is a union of values, democracy, human rights, not a narrowly defined geography or a union of rigidity, end of quote. In September 2012, Erdogan, during a CNN interview, was asked whether Turkey still wants to join the European Union. Erdogan responded by saying, there are 5 million Turks in Europe and 3 million Turks in Germany alone. We are a natural member of the European Union. Germany invited Turkish workers 50 years ago. However, 50 years have passed and we have waited at the European Union's doorstep. No other country has experienced such a thing. We will be patient until a point. However, when we cross that point, we will bring light to the situation and decide accordingly. So what is the Turkish public's opinion? The Turkish public has increasingly become skeptical as negotiations have been delayed. A mid-2006 Eurobarometer survey revealed that 43% of Turkish citizens view the EU positively, just 35% trust the EU, 45% support enlargement, and 29% support an EU constitution. A 2007 poll revealed that Turkish support for accession to the EU was at 41.9%, with 27.7% opposed and 20% indifferent. And according to the Transatlantic Trend Survey for 2012, 53% of Turks have an unfavourable view of the EU, and most Turks believe that working with Asia is more important to their national interests than working with Cyprus issue. The island nation of Cyprus has been divided for almost 40 years. It's a division which led to the Greek Cypriot South joining the EU as the Republic of Cyprus and prospering from its membership. Meanwhile, in the north, the self proclaimed Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus remained isolated after a 2004 referendum on reuniting the island was turned down by the south. <coughs> So the Cyprus conflict occupies a very important place in EU-Turkey relations. Turkey's accession negotiations with the EU have been severely curtailed due to the irresolution of the Cyprus conflict. So here is a list of the 35 chapters that each candidate wanting to join the EU must will first open up and then address. So once one's opened, you can't close it. They have to address all the points, and then it's closed, and then another one opens. So that's just to give you an idea of all the chapters. And for Turkey, these these chapters have been frozen, so all the list, and 17 frozen, so it makes it very difficult for Turkey to complete the Aki Communautaire. So the EU Council froze the opening of eight chapters over Turkey's rejection to open its ports and airports to traffic from Cyprus in 2006. Some of the chapters um, did not proceed to the next stage in the process because they are blocked by Cyprus. Some of the chapters did not proceed to the next stage because they were blocked by France or by Germany. 
and so recent adva advancements. France, which along with Germany hindered the Turkish accession process under the former president Nicolas Sarkozy, signaled a few months ago that it would lift the blockade. And in a gesture of goodwill, the new government under the socialist president Francois Hollande said that he was ready to open up another chapter of the process. So what are the current challenges? In February 2013, the new government under the socialist president Francois Hollande agreed to lift its objections and is open to another chapter of the process. However, this decision came to a halt due to the Turkish government's crackdown on nationwide protests that began on the 28th of May 2013 over plans to build over Taksim Jetsi Park in central Istanbul. Over past months, the European Parliament has criticised Turkey's handling of the demonstrations, eliciting accusations from Turkey's Europe Minister Ejim bin Vagis that he was guilty of disproportionate, unbalanced and irrational declarations and dirty plans for and manipulation of national and international instruments. So the EU revoked Turkey in June 2013 for its crackdown on anti-government protesters and postponed a new round of membership talks for at least four months that stated that path to the EU remained open. On Tuesday the 25th of June 2013, EU government supported a German-inspired proposal which agreed to open the chapter on regional policy, which is chapter 22, but delaying the formal launch of talks until after October the 9th report by the European Commission on Reforms and Human Rights in Turkey. And EU governments will meet again after the report comes out to set a date for talks in light of what it says about Turkey's behaviour. So future prospects. So the question of Turkey's accession presents the EU with many challenges and opportunities and raises significant questions about the EU's identity and questions about its future role in the international community. If Turkey is admitted to the EU, it could serve as a model for the Middle Eastern countries by demonstrating that democracy and Islam are not antagonists. Turkish membership would also reinforce the idea that the EU is built on the recognition of universal rights and values as opposed to exclusionary ideas of cultural and religious homogeneity. It is also argued that the question of Turkish EU membership will largely depend on how individuals understand the nature and the role of the EU in the global community. If political discourses focus predominantly on the issue of culture, religion and identity, the more likely it is that support for Turkish membership will remain low. However, if discussions are held and justified along post-national arguments, the more likely Turkish um, support for Turkish accession will be high. Thank you. Thank you.